Jesus. I don't know about you, but Jesus is on the throne today. Jesus wants to meet you right where you're at tonight. Jesus wants to be the center of your life. If you call on the name of Jesus, everything's going to be all right. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that we can call on the name of Jesus and that you're right where we are. I pray that tonight, Father, I would decrease so that you can increase. I ask that you would help me to deliver your living word with, with the integrity that it holds. And help me, Father, not to dilute it or pollute it or substitute any part of it. Let your people receive the knowledge and insight and understanding of who you are and who they are in you. That we can glorify your name. Holy Spirit, I ask that you penetrate every heart, every mind. You capture every thought. You remove every distraction every hindrance in the house of God. Satan, the Lord rebukes you and we command you back to the pit of hell from whence you came. We come against every spirit of anxiety, depression, anything, every sickness, every illness, every disease, everything that is not of you, God. We bind it and we cast it back to the pit of hell. Father, we ask that you would loosen from heaven angels that will war on your behalf. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are in the midst. Bless the hearer tonight and let him who has an ear to hear hear what the Lord has to say can you give Jesus a hand clap hallelujah 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 father we thank you that we are more than conquerors we thank you that the spirit of God lives within us God, we stir up, Father, the gifts and the callings of God that lie within us. God, we speak to our mountains. God, we move, Father, everything that is not of you. We stand on your living word because your word says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Your word says that you have made us head and not the tail. Your word says that we are above and not beneath. Your word says that we can speak to our mountain and it will be moved. Your word says to call those things that are not as though they are. Your word says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Your word says it, Father. So God, we thank you and we glorify you in the name of Jesus. You may have your seats, wonderful people of God. And if you're a regular tonight, I want you to give yourselves a hand for your consistency, for your faithfulness. If you've been watching online, welcome, God bless you. Give yourselves a hand for your faithfulness, for your consistency. And if tonight you're visiting and if it's your first time, can you just wave so we can welcome you with a love first welcome in the house of God? If this is your first time tonight, amen. Welcome back. If it's your first time online, welcome and welcome back, amen. I want to thank God for my salvation and everything that he has done. For those of you that have prayed for us on the Africa trip, thank you so much. Thank you so much for covering the team in prayer. We got there safely and we came home safely. So to God be the glory and everything that happened in between is to the glory and honor of God, amen. Let's remember to keep our pastors in prayer, amen. Let's remember to keep the pastoral leadership in prayer and the staff here at Love First. And in return, we are keeping all of you in prayer, amen? Amen. amen. Before we go into our vision and faith confession, if you're a student, I'm sure you are ready to rise and head to the back, yes? So we're going to go ahead and dismiss our students. Are y'all enjoying this heat? Y'all, you know it's summertime, right? And so summertime, Florida is supposed to be like 90 degrees, right? It's been hot, I know. I, I've been loving it from inside the air conditioning. <laughs> so tonight, we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. And 
Tonight, I want to look at John chapter 8 from a different vantage point or viewpoint. And I'll tell you what I mean in just a moment. Let's do our faith confession. Amen. You ready? All right. Y'all look good tonight. To equip people with the knowledge of God's word, to empower people to seek God's face in daily prayer, to encounter and be filled with the Holy Spirit, to evangelize our community, our county, and our country, to embrace every person in godly love, for God is love, for each one to reach one. If you have your Bibles, your phones, whatever you have to take notes or you read your Bible on, let's do our, our faith confession. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I believe that my life will never be the same after hearing and doing the living Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So as I was reading and studying and looking at John chapter 8, you know, what, what kept popping out at me was, you know, the nerve of the devil. There is a saying by, by a, a writer by the name of Sir Walter Scott. And he wrote a play, poems in the 1800s. And there is a particular phrase that always sticks out to me. And, and, and you may know it. And it goes a little something like this. Oh, what a tangle web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. What does that mean? That means when one acts dishonestly, they are initiating problems and a domino structure of complications to follow, which eventually will spiral out of control and ultimately ensnare the one who set it in motion who set it in motion. And I want to look at chapter 8 from the vantage point and viewpoint of exposing the enemy for who he really is. And there are many tactics he uses, but I want to focus on one tonight, and we're going to see it weaved throughout John chapter 8. You can show the video. The word entrapment. It means to illegally create a condition or scenario that induces someone to commit a crime. It's the action of enticing someone to do something that otherwise they wouldn't have done. It means ensnarement or bait, decoy, trick, snare, to entangle. The origin is from an old French word, entrapper, snared and a trap, entrapment. Throughout the book of John, in John chapter 8, the enemy has been after Jesus since before he was born. And Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees because the enemy is trying to entrap him. And we're going to see that throughout chapter 8 and see what we can learn from it. Now, before we jump in, I want you to know that Jesus is dealing with the devil. But he's dealing with the devil through the form of of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. The Pharisees often received harsh rebukes. If you look up Matthew chapter 23, you'll see it where Jesus lays down the law and he tells the Pharisees about themselves. You've heard it, the seven woes. That's right. Woe to you. I mean, he's just going down the list. He tells them, woe to you teachers of the law, to you Pharisees that practice that do not practice what they preach. He says the Pharisees, they love the seat of honor. Pharisees, they shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. He told them, you make the followers twice as much a child of hell as you are. That's what he, that's, what, that's Jesus. And he says, and he calls them outrightly, you are blind guides. Blind fools, in verse 17, he calls them, you hypocrites. 
you whitewashed tombs. And he leads off with you brood of vipers. This is Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 telling the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, this is who you are. But check out what Jesus also tells the people. He tells the people, listen to what they say because what they say is the truth, but don't do what they do. He tells them, listen to what they tell you because what they say is the truth, but don't do what they do. How many know? I mean, think about that. How many know it takes a lot to be an example? It takes a lot to stand by your word. It takes a lot to be consistent, right? And so the Pharisees know they were holding to the law, but were excluding themselves from holding to the law as well. And Jesus got on them because they placed burdens on the people that God never intended. And then they hypocritically exempted themselves from the very rules that they taught. You know, we tell our kids to do certain things. And do they see us do the opposite? Because, man, they'll definitely hold it up against us, right? They'll definitely say, but mama, you said. But mom, you didn't. And they're our best critics, right? Because <laughs> our babies will tell us the truth. <laughs> they'll tell other people the truth, too. And so it takes a lot to be an example. The Pharisees thought that since they obeyed the letter of the law, they were right with God. But Jesus, Jesus strongly disagreed with that. The Pharisees believed that adding rules to God's law was necessary. But God's words says otherwise. So Jesus is dealing with the devil in the form of the Pharisees. Someone say entrapment. Tonight's lesson is about entrapment. One of the tactics of the enemy. And I want to start off by reading verses 2 through 6. Verses 2 through 6. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand up before the group and, Jesus, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. You know, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing the man of God. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. I want to pause right there. The devil will always come to challenge you. Jesus was going about his business, wanting to teach the people. At dawn, he went down to the Mount of Olives so he could teach the people, just like the devil. As he sat down and he began to teach, teach them about his word, teach them about who he was, here comes the enemy, bringing a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Question number one, where was the man? Because the law says... Both should have been brought before him. But see, the enemy is deceitful, and he weaves his way through picking and chooses what he uses to distract you, what he uses to come after you, what he uses to take from you. And Jesus in chapter 8 gets downright dirty. You, you're going to see that in a minute. Tell the person next to you, don't let them use you. Don't let them use you. Me and my husband learned that in one of our art of marriage. Don't let them use you. We start getting a heat of fellowship. Don't let them use you. <laughs> and so Jesus is now dealing with opposition. Jesus just wants to teach the people, let them know about the bread of life, who he is, where they're going, and the kingdom. And here comes the enemy to disrupt. To disrupt. As soon as Jesus began to teach, disruption came. Understand, when you get ready to sit down and read your word, study your word, get up and come to church, get up and come to the house of God, get up and do the things for God, distraction and disruption will come. And don't try to fast because somebody will buy your meal for the next week. Disruption will come. The Jewish leaders had already disregarded the law by arresting the woman without the man. So they already messed up. They wanted to come to Jesus to trap him by bringing a valid question 
but deadly motives because they were trying to entrap him. So they only brought the woman, so they already messed up with the law. So they're not adhering to the law anyway. The law required that both parties that were caught in adultery be stoned. The leaders were using the woman as a trap so they could trick Jesus. Be careful and watch people's motives. And be careful of our own motives and why we do things. And our service is always unto the Lord. Because they tried to, because the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law knew the law so well, they thought they could trick the maker of the laws. They thought, they thought, they thought, they thought, but they were deceived themselves. Deception is very, very deceiving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only best way I could put it, because I always tell you know, my sisters in Christ and my pastors, if you ever see something in me, please tell me because I don't always see myself. I don't always see the things that I may or may not be doing. So I welcome your input. I welcome your advice. I welcome it because I want to make sure I'm serving Christ in the capacity that I need to. And because Jesus knew the law so well, he knew that if he would have accused the woman, he would have violated Moses' law. But if he urged them to stone her or execute her, they would report him to the Romans, who did not permit Jews to carry out their own executions. We don't know what Jesus wrote in the dust, but some of them say he could have speculated that he wrote the sins of their accusers. So they were trying to catch Jesus in a catch-22. But Jesus said, I'm not having it. Let's read on. Let's look at verses 7 through 11. And here the Pharisees, when they kept on questioning him, they was just bugging Jesus. You know, they already asked him the question in front of the whole um, crowd that he was teaching as if to embarrass him, as if he was going to give a wrong answer, as if to humiliate him. And he doesn't say anything. He just stoops down and starts writing in the sand. And here they come. But, but, but Jesus, Jesus. Verse 7, so when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, check out Jesus, Jesus is a boss. Jesus said, let any one of you, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he goes back to his business. He goes back to bending down and writing in the sand as if to say, I'm not even thinking about y'all because I already know where y'all at. That's what Jesus says. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 9 says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Somebody say one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked a woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? The woman said, no, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is very interesting because the woman that they decided to use as an example, as bait to ensnare Jesus, God works everything out for your good. So no matter if someone is after you or trying to trip you up or how the enemy will come, God will work that thing out so it works out for your good. See, when they brought that woman before Jesus, they thought they were going to get an opportunity to stone the woman and put Jesus in a predicament. But what happened? Jesus put them in a predicament and that that woman got saved, forgiven, the mercies of Christ. See, some days you wake up thinking one thing, Jesus steps on the scene and he turns that thing around to let something else. And when they brought the woman before Jesus, the Savior of the world, amen, that woman would have a second chance at life. Bet the devil didn't expect that one. That was a mic drop moment. Drop the mic. And it's important to note that the compassion that Jesus had, because Jesus 
upheld the legal penalty for adultery. He could not be accused of being against the law, but by saying that only a sinless, by saying that only a sinless person could throw the first stone. But in all of that, he highlighted his, the importance of mercy and forgiveness. The importance of mercy and forgiveness. Imagine the complete humiliation of this woman. Imagine them yanking her out of whatever she was at, however she was, bringing her in front of all these crowds of people. The humiliation. And I'm sure all the other women there was wondering, what a man. And so they used her. And you got to understand that sometimes in life, the enemy will try and come and use you. He will try to entrap you. He will try and speak things to you that are above all lies. The Bible says he is the father of all lies. And trust me, if you serve Christ, you ain't a friend of the enemy. You are not a friend of the enemy. With God's help, we can always accept Jesus' forgiveness and stop our wrongdoing. Let's read verses 12 through 20. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here we go. Here he comes, the enemy. The Pharisees challenged him again. This is one of many. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. The Pharisees wouldn't even live and write in the first place. And they want to tell Jesus how he's living. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony, it's valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you, you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. I bet you Jesus probably said that with a lot of attitude. <laughs> you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. Stand with the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, well, where is your father? They're looking so in the natural. They are looking so in the natural. We have to be believers who learn to walk by faith because you won't see what you need to in the natural. You can only see it in the spirit. How do I see it in the spirit? You draw close to the Lord and understand his heartbeat and understand what he has for you and what he's called you to do. We want to be like the sons of Issachar who knew how to discern the times, who can test the temperature of the atmosphere and know that, that that's my father. That's my father's voice. My father's calling me this way. My father's calling. But they saw things in the natural. Where is your father? Because they were so hell-bent on trapping him, trapping the man of God. They asked him, where's your father? And look what Jesus tell them. You don't know me or my father. Y'all, I just got all attitude all on this because I, I was looking, I was just like, What? He says, you don't know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Let's stop there and look at a few things. The Pharisees thought that Jesus was either, either a lunatic or a liar. Really, because they said some harsh stuff. We ain't even got into the harsh stuff yet. There's no such thing as Christian cussing, but you're going to hear some harsh stuff in a minute. But they thought he was either a lunatic or a liar because they didn't choose the third alternative that Jesus gave them. What is the third alternative that Jesus gives us? He says to believe on me, the truth. All they needed to do was believe the truth. But they were blind, and they chose not to believe. Jesus provided them with that alternative. But the Pharisees refused to consider it. They never recognized him as the Messiah. They never recognized him as Lord. 
The Pharisees argued that Jesus' claim was legally invalid because he had no other witnesses, yet the witnesses that Jesus had were heavenly witnesses and witnesses they wouldn't have seen nor known, which was his father. Jesus responded that his confirming witness was God himself. And Jesus, with the two of them, made the two witnesses that were needed according to the law. Verses 21 through 23. Once more, Jesus said to them, once more, two challenges have now come Jesus' way. Jesus is reminding them and telling them again and again. Once more, he says to them, I'm going away, and you're going to look for me, and you will die in your sin. But where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? They just can't see it. Is that why he said, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, and here he goes. When he says, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he, I am the one who has come, I am the savior of the world. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. And he's talking about a spiritual death. There is a spiritual death. We all pass away in this body. But there's a heaven and there's a hell. And there is a spiritual death. Take note of this. People will die in their sins if they reject Jesus because they are rejecting the only way to be rescued from sin. I understand we make mistakes. I understand in our, human, our humanity we, we falter, we fall short. But that's why he created repentance, that we can pick ourselves up and begin again. And so we have to understand that if we don't accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there's only one place we can go. There's only one place, and it is not heaven, in case children are watching. It is hell. Where are you looking? We cannot focus on the world's values and miss what is most valuable. What is most valuable? It's having eternal life in Christ. We have to learn to be believers that know that God has a plan and a purpose for us. A lot of times we want to sit in a life that's cushy and comfortable, not understanding that the trials and the testings and the tribulations that come our way, James says, they produce things within us. They produce so that we can be a witness to others. But a lot of times we want to shy away, we want to run from those things instead of embracing it. This is what he means when he says, count it all joy when you fall into trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith is going to produce not only just patience, but other things that's going to benefit and glorify God. And we cannot be cotton candy Christians. Let's read verses 25 through 30. The Pharisees get real bold. They tell him, they say, who are you? They asked. And here's Jesus, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Again, Jesus replied, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. Just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed. Even as he spoke. We have to remember Jesus is in a place where he's teaching people. 
And as the Pharisees are coming up and throwing all these different accusations and different challenges at him, trying to distract him and entrap him and get his attention, the people are hearing, the people are watching. And even through all of that, the people still believed. You can't tell me God can't work it out every situation, every circumstance. During the entire time of the accusations, he's still teaching. And even as the enemy tried to ensnare him, Jesus still stood his ground. We have a law in Florida, it's called stand your ground, right? I'd like to use that in the spirit, stand your ground. Don't back down from what the enemy brings your way. Don't retreat when the enemy wants to throw something your way. In other words, you stand your ground with faith and the assurance, with the blood of Jesus, the word of God, and you speak to it. You speak to it. You speak to it in the name of Jesus because every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. Let's read verses 31 through 47. Jesus tells him, he says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be free, set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. <laughs> if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, Abraham didn't do such things. You were doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? I'm not, you not, I'm not, we not. Come on, what's, what, where's the breakdown in communication? This is not the first time Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this. Why is it not clear? Because you are unable to hear what I say. There's a scripture that says the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers that has shut off the hearing and the understanding. And even if we are in a place where we cannot hear and understand, we are always in a place to be obedient to the word of God. We are always in a place to do what we should do as children of God. Even when I wasn't saved, I knew what obedience was. I didn't have to be saved to know what obedience is or to even move in obedience. Because when I was enslaved by the enemy and trapped by the devil, trust me, I was obedient to this, to that, to that, and some of that over there. I'm just saying. He says, because you are unable to hear what I say. Look what he tells them. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not whole, Can you imagine somebody walked up to you and told you this? <laughs> you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you still don't believe me. Some people just ain't trying to hear it. Some people ain't going to hear it. You can try and tell them till you turn blue in the face. 
But if you know they're not going to hear and they're not going to listen, you give it over to the Lord, you send up your prayers on their behalf, and you keep stepping and you move on to the next one. Because some people just will not hear it. He says, you do not believe me. 46, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? They could not catch him. They could not entrap him. They could not ensnare him. They could not entice him. He says, if I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, Here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Ouch. Those are some harsh words. Jesus puts the Pharisees in check, but they're not hearing it to be in check. He is putting them seriously in check, and they're just not, they not getting it. So it's like, did the rebuke even stick? Did it make a difference? Even if it didn't for them, I know it does for the hearer, for you and I, who hear God's word. Jesus himself is the truth, and that's what sets us free. He frees us from the continued slavery to sin. He frees us from, ready for this, get ready, self-deception. Me and my husband go through that all the time. You didn't see that. No, I didn't. No, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Uh huh. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. No, you did. No, I didn't. You no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. It's only two of us in the house. <laughs> Who else gonna do it? You know, we're like you did that. No, you no. Yo, come on now. <laughs> and we have to give in and understand that we can be deceived. We can, and we have to be very mindful. He also shows us clearly that the way to eternal life, the way to eternal life. Is through Jesus. As we seek to serve God, Jesus' perfect truth frees us to be all that he created us to be. Sin has a way of enslaving us. And you heard the saying, it'll take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and just beat you up. And sin is very subtle. It starts with being comfortable Comfortability leads to complacency. Complacency leads to deception. Well, it's okay. I'm all right. I'm not going there. <laughs> it does. It does. And it'll keep you longer. And before you know it, you're knee deep in it. My husband went to pick up the food for tonight. And he ran into a lady in the store, and she was, you know, having a hard time. And he says, you got you to gotta come to church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you. She said, please pray. She says, I used to go to church. I used to go to your church. And, I, and he's like, okay, I'm going to pray for you, but what are you going to do? Because we could pray for anyone all day long, but believer, what will you do? What will you do? There's things that we have to do as the children of God. Because sin has a way of enslaving us, controlling us, dominating us, and dictating our actions. If sin is restraining, mastering, or enslaving you, Jesus can break that over your life. No matter what habit, what addiction, Jesus can break it. The attitudes and actions of these leaders clearly identified them as followers of Satan. He says, when, you, when, you, <laughs> when he said you make your followers just as much a child as a hell of a, from hell as you are, that just threw me for a loop. That's crazy. Because they'll have to give an account. You do know that, right? They'll have to give an account. Satan still uses people to obstruct God's work. I understand next time you make that bold move, that faith move, to do what God has called you to do, to move into position, to get your child to teens ministry, your children to children's ministry, for you to get to Bible study, watch Bible study, serve in the ministry. Understand there's going to be distraction. Understand that the enemy is going to come against you when you try and read your Bible in the morning, even if it's only a few minutes, a devotion. He's going to come. The thoughts are going to come. Did I leave the iron on? Oh, my God, what am I cook for dinner? What am I going to eat for lunch? 
Understand that those are just tactics and devices of the enemy and you have to rein it in. Take every thought captive and bring it into submission into the obedience of Christ Jesus. Take every thought captive. Verses 48 through 58, and I'm going to get you out of here. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Can you imagine he called the man of God? Remember, we talked about the Samaritans, right? They were a mixed breed. They were a hated race. They were half-breeds. That's like cussing Jesus out. And he tells them, he says, aren't we right in saying you are Samaritan and demon-possessed? And he goes on and he says, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father. And you, you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever, somebody say whoever, obeys my word will never see death. Whoever obeys my word will never see death. Will never see death or taste it. They tell him, here's, and they've been challenging Jesus all throughout chapter 8. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Verse 54. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I'd be a liar just like you. But I do know him, and I obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said. Looking in the natural. Man, looking in the natural will get you tripped up. Don't look in the natural. It will trip you up. And unfortunately, we're always looking in the natural, right? We worry about how we look, our appearance. And we have to learn to look in the spirit and know that Jesus is on our side. They're looking in the, you are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Jesus said, very truly, I tell you. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. I am, I was, I is. That is Jesus. At this, look at the audacity. They have the audacity, the nerve. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. Man, Jesus is a ninja. What, look what he does. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus himself, slipping away from the temple grounds, vanished in the crowd. He's a ninja. Jesus is bad. It wasn't his time. They came after the man of God. They tried to ensnare and entrap him with their rules, their laws, their regulations, instead of just choosing to believe. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you are the son of man and that you have everlasting life in your hands. I believe that you died on. I believe because the Bible says blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Believer, if you're not a believer tonight, you're going to get an opportunity to believe to be to to be a believer. Unbelief is a trap used by the enemy. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, I said it earlier, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If you don't know Jesus tonight, or if you find yourself, I need to work on my faith muscle, I need to work on believing what the word of God says about me, about my situation, about my circumstances. Because when you believe it, man, you walk with a whole new swag. When you believe it, man, you speak with authority. Man, when you believe it, somebody tells you know about something that you know God has says yes, is done. See, people can't talk you out of nothing. People cannot talk you out of your blessing. People cannot talk you out of what God has for you. People won't be able to talk you into a corner. People won't be able to talk you out of anything that God has for you because you've heard from God. 
Don't allow the enemy to take what God has rightfully given you. Through all the challenges that Jesus dealt with in John chapter 8, the people didn't suffer. In fact, the people believed and they got what they needed. Will you get what you need tonight from Jesus? Will you lay a hold to what God has for you? If you don't know Jesus tonight, we're going to say a prayer. And if you have unbelief or, or you need another level of faith, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. And there are going to be ministers at the altar for you tonight, for you to come to take that step of faith and say, agree with me in prayer that my faith is elevated to another. Agree with me in prayer that I speak to my mountain. Agree with me in prayer that I go to the next level in the Lord. Agree with me by faith. But if you don't know the Lord tonight, every head bowed and every eye closed, the Bible says that we all fall short. The Bible tells us that none are perfect. But if we believe on the one who came and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he believe in our hearts, that he rose from the dead, Romans 10, 9 says, then we shall be saved. So if that's you tonight, I want to say a prayer for you. You can type it in the chat. If you need to send a prayer request, go to lfcc.tv forward slash pray. Put in your prayer request. We get them. We'll be praying. Father, I ask that you would come into my life, come into my heart. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose on the third day. I ask that you would fill me with your precious Holy Spirit, that you would forgive me of my sins and that you would heal my heart. I ask that you would help me to continue to walk with you all the days of my life. And I ask that you would be glorified. I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. Continue to help me grow in my belief in you. If that was you, we want to hear about it. Send us the prayer. Again, lfcc.tv forward slash pray. We're going to be praying for you. We thank God for you. And if you're in the sanctuary, you will have an opportunity to pray for another level of faith with the ministers at the altars because there's nothing greater than someone coming in agreement with you. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for grace. Oh my gosh. We thank you for grace and mercy that you've given us. We thank you that you look upon us with love and compassion, mercy and forgiveness. So Father, let our lives bring you glory in everything that we do. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Can you give Jesus a hand clap? All right, we're going to go ahead and take a moment and take our offering. Amen? Amen. And you are never like God when you give, because he is a giver, right? He gave his one and only son. And so we have so many ways to give. Amen? We even now have Zelle. I'm like, okay, so we can give one of three ways. You can go to lfcc.tv forward slash give. You can text 84321 to give cash app dollar sign love first church or we can zell it at give at love first christian center.com or if you just like to toss it in the mail put a stamp on it you can mail it right over there to the mailing address also let's not forget deadline is coming up for the jennifer newman scholarship amen i've been told you know you can apply for the scholarship as long as you're in school <laughs> going to college more than once so Go to lfcc.tv forward slash resources. Let's pray for our giving, amen? Father, we thank you for the giving right now. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for everyone who is able to give, those who aren't, that you would just bless them. We ask that you use it to the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask you that you continue, Lord God, to pour out your blessings, Father, upon our church, upon the people of God. We pray that you increase with, Father, promotions, Lord, and just their businesses, that you would bless them, that, Father, they would be able to give, even on a greater measure. So, God, we give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Let's pray for the food. Stretch your hands to the food. Father, we thank you for the food that's provided, Father, for the people. We ask that you make it nourishing to our body. Bless those who are less fortunate that go without. And we give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anniversary cruise. Announcements. Women's retreat. Uh, go to lfcc.tv to register for the cruise. Buy your t-shirt. Register for our women's retreat. And we prayed for the food. So with that being said, again, I want to remind you. Come, let the ministers pray for you as we dismiss. Let's stand, 1 John 4, 4. And ministers, if you can go ahead and make your way. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater ye are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Come and let them pray for you. Watch God do something great in your life. We love you. We are praying for you. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. Amen.